This, to my mind, is one of the most remarkable photographs that's ever been taken of a lion. It shows Elsa, the famous lioness that was reared by Joy and George Adamson. She had just killed this buffalo, killed it for herself. And yet, at this moment, when all her most powerful instincts of savagery, the instincts of a hunter, were aroused, she allowed these two men to drag her prey, her kill, from her, and yet do nothing whatever to prevent them. She thus proved that she was a lioness of two worlds, a lioness who could live in the world of the wild, savage bush, and also in the world of human beings. Her story starts several years ago, when George Adamson brought back three young orphan cubs. George and Joy, between them, reared the three, and when they became too large to be convenient household pets, two of them were sent to European zoos. But Elsa, their favorite, they kept, and they determined to try and return her to the life of a wild lioness in the bush. But this wasn't as easy as you might think, for they had to teach her how to stalk her prey and how to hunt and how to kill. How they succeeded in doing so, Joy Adamson told in her book, Born Free. But eventually, they did release Elsa in a wild and remote part of Kenya. Every now and again, they revisited her and announced their arrival with a rifle shot. And soon afterwards, Elsa always appeared. And on one occasion, when she appeared, she brought with her proof that she really had become a wild lioness in the full sense of the word. For she brought with her three small cubs. Now, sadly, Elsa is dead. But a few months ago, before she died, my cameraman colleague, Geoffrey Mulligan, and I were fortunate enough to be invited by the Adamsons out to Kenya to see Elsa and her cubs. We arrived at the end of the dry season, when the whole of Kenya was dry and bare and dusty. Here in the north, the country is covered by thick spiny bush, all of it at this time of the year quite leafless, except by the river, where the trees, nourished by a permanent supply of water, can grow tall and were in full leaf. It was in this green oasis that the Adamsons had made their permanent camp. George Adamson is senior game warden of the Northern Frontier Province, a vast area of over 120,000 square miles. And here, by the river, he has a good opportunity of observing game for animals come from many miles around to drink. Little spotted doves were always sipping from the riverside pools. And this pack of baboons were regular visitors coming each evening not only to drink, but to dig for roots in the soft earth of the riverbanks. On the opposite side, that she would come. In fact, she had not visited the camp for several days past, and she might be far away in the bush hunting to provide food for her cubs. When evening came, she It might well be that Elsa, fighting to defend her territory, had been badly injured in the battle and was lying up somewhere in need of help. So the next morning, the Adamsons set out to look for her. She might be anywhere in the surrounding wild country, and the task of locating her seemed almost impossible. But George had lived in Kenya for most of his life, and for him the dusty ground was a book full of information which could be easily read. Here, a lizard had left a trail. Birds and other small creatures had recently passed this way too, but there were no signs of a lion. From the thorn trees, little bush babies watched the Adamsons as they searched.
They had thought that Elsa might have headed for a large tree which recently had been one of her favourite haunts where she slept during the heat of the day but they could see no sign whatever of her tracks in that direction. George was sure that she must have gone some other way after the battle. Anxiously they searched for hour after hour as the sun grew hotter and the day wore on. And then, at last, they found Elsa's spoor. The tracks led towards a huge rock mountain close by the place where Elsa had given birth to her cubs. George judged from the tracks that Elsa was limping. She must be injured. Perhaps she was lying up, stiff and sore, quite close by, having been unable to get as far as her favourite rock. Come on, Elsa! Come on, Elsa! Come on, El. But when, at last, the rock came into sight, there was no sign of her in her favourite position, basking in the sun on the summit. There was no doubt from her limp that she was injured. In the bush was now responding to the call of a human foster mother. Two of the cubs, whom Joy called Timid One and Little Elsa, kept their distance, unsure about the human being with whom their mother was so intimate. But the third cub, Jesper, regarded himself as his mother's bodyguard. Come on, Jesper! Jesper, no, no, no! Jesper! Jesper! No, no! Oh, oh, oh! <laughs> Jesper had always taken this protective attitude towards his mother ever since he had been a really tiny cub. And unlike his brother and sister, it was seldom that he left Elsa's side. Come 
When Joy at last managed to examine Elsa closely, she discovered that there were deep wounds, both on Elsa's left forepaw and on her hind legs, where she had been bitten by the rival lioness during the battle. Clearly, it would be several days before she would be able to hunt again and provide food for the cubs. Meanwhile, they would go hungry. It was important, therefore, to persuade her to come back to camp where she could be treated and she and the cubs could be fed. But would she come, injured as she was? Certainly, the cubs would not come without her. Jasper, the faithful, received a mother's thanks. Now, as she descended, it was easy to see how much Elsa's wounds were handicapping her. They were obviously paining her a great deal, and it might well be that she would be unwilling to undertake the long walk through the bush back to camp. Even when Elsa had at last limped to the bottom of the rock, timid one seemed unwilling to leave and lingered at the top with his sister, little Elsa. Neither of them were in any way tame or in any degree under the Adamson's control. Ooh, Margie, Margie, Elsa, come on. But Jesper, as always, was by his mother's side. It was over a mile back to camp, and Elsa had to stop for frequent rests. 
Then Joy and George caressed her and encouraged her to continue, while little Elsa and timid one watched nervously from the bushes. Even now, Jesper was by no means sure of Joy's intentions. And Timin One lived up to his name. Jesper once more rejoined his mother after having let her go momentarily out of his sight. And trailing far in the rear came Timid One. At last they reached camp, Jesper leading the way. Elsa went straight to the food that was ready for her, for she was very hungry, not having eaten for over 24 hours. But Jesper reconnoitred the camp, perhaps to make sure that everything was safe. The Africans treated him with great caution. They knew quite well that he was uncontrollable and the worst thing they could do was to run away, for Jesper would certainly chase them and might bowl them over. Joy, meanwhile, prepared some medicine which she hoped might prevent Elsa's wounds from turning septic, if she could persuade her to take it, mixed in with some titbits of which she knew Elsa was particularly fond. There are some liberties, it seems, which even a favoured bodyguard must not take. It was now evening and Elsa headed for the tent, for inside she knew she would be free from the attacks of the tetsi flies which always begin biting at dusk. The cubs too, wild though they were, nonetheless recognized the protection that the tent offered. First, timid one went in. And then Jesper, taking his dinner with him. Only little Elsa found the scent of human beings too distasteful and remained outside.
Elsa, Jasper and Timid One stayed there until well after dark, waiting for the time when, just before midnight, they would all together return to the bush and the world in which human beings have no part. The territory for which George is responsible stretches from these falls of the infant Tana River several hundred miles northwards to the Abyssinian border. It's a country rich in many kinds of game, large and small. Buck, zebra, jerenook, antelope, buffalo, rhinoceros, lion, elephant and giraffe, they all abound. The area around Elsa's Rock is now a game reserve and all these creatures are protected. It's George's job to ensure their safety. But it's not an easy one, for although hunting is illegal, there are always plenty who will break the law for financial gain. A gang of poachers had set this trap hoping to catch a rhino whose horn they could sell at an enormous price to Chinese traders. The string crossed the game trail covered with fresh rhino spore. Then it ran up the tree to the weighted spear which was covered with lethal poison. It could have killed a rhinoceros and it could equally well have killed Elsa. The presence of these poaching gangs who had followed the game to the neighbourhood of the river was one of the reasons that had brought the Adamsons back here after they had abandoned Elsa to live her life as a normal lioness in the bush. But on their return, Elsa was refusing to abandon them and as a result, their friendship had continued and developed and it was clearly a friendship which Elsa valued and enjoyed as much as the Adamsons did. Although her wounds were painful, Elsa willingly allowed Joy to smear antiseptic ointment on them. At such times, Joy had to be able to gauge exactly Elsa's feelings, for gentle though the lioness was, she was still a creature who could kill a zebra with a bite of her fangs and a blow from her paws. I asked Joy how she could tell if Elsa was irritable. If I can't get close to her, I can see chiefly on her flattening ears and on the half-closed eyes, which she usually keeps in a sort of upraised position, um, have a very cold expression to her normally big soft clothes she has in it and uh, then I naturally know she is very much on the alert. Well, if I can get close enough to hold her pose, uh, I have a very clear indication by their dampness. If she's nervous, like a human hand, she perspires and then she uh, is slightly wet and then I know she's either on alert or afraid or not on ease. From the afternoon, she brought the cups across the river. She was so touchingly embarrassed, rather, to suddenly arrive with three babies instead of her normal self. Uh, she was definitely very, very proud of them and loved them. But the fact was that she said, well, now here I am in my family. I'm coming, bring it to you. And ever since that day, Elsa had regularly brought her family to the Adamsons, giving them the pleasure of watching her three young cubs. It had never been part of the Adamsons' plan to tame the cubs in any way, but in spite of their forbearance, things had worked out differently. Elsa is, by a wonderful sample, giving these cubs an idea that we are friends and the cubs react friendly towards us. Up to now, Jasper is the only one who comes near us now, after eight months, who is sometimes trying to touch us in a friendly way of making friends, to be in the party, to get the same treatment as Elsa does. When Elsa comes to us and wants to be rest, Jasper would come along to have the same treatment. But he thought we must keep the cups wild, as far as we are in power, in order to make it easier for them later on, to adapt themselves to wildlife and not to be a danger to any human who may come into their orbit. 
But, but during these two last months, he became far too intimate with our routine and our tent life. He comes now into the tent. He comes now to us. He even eats out of his pie dish, where else I get hurt it bits. He does all these which we hope to prevent. But he isn't the most efficient one. Little Elsa, who is by far the wildest and as shy as she has ever been from the first moment, she is the only one who always keeps outside the tent. She's always outside. She's always the most alert as far as danger goes. While the big brothers play or sleep or doze and, and couldn't care less, little Elsa always is on guard. But she has, I think, the greatest genuine trend uh, to, of a wild lion. Now Elsa has died, and these cubs are orphans as their mother was before them. Big though they are, they cannot yet survive by themselves in the wild. Elsa had begun to teach them how to stalk their prey and something of the laws about wind and sporing, but their education is not complete. Furthermore, they still have their milk teeth, which are short and blunt, and not sufficiently powerful for them to be able to hunt by themselves. Elsa didn't gain her permanent teeth until she was over a year old. Perhaps the cubs may be able to join up with a wild pride of lions. Perhaps the Adamsons will succeed in solving their problem as they were able to solve Elsa's when she was a cub. Certainly, no one could be better equipped or more experienced to safeguard their future than George and Joy Adamson, whose friendship with Elsa must surely have been one of the most intimate and remarkable of any between man and wild beast. <laughs>